what is my real motivation for being in a leadership role? Why do I want to become a leader? So that I can get all the recognition, I can get all the glory, or I don't really care about that. I just want to improve other people's lives. The uh, <laughs> real guru of meditation is Pandit Dasa. He's written a book about it. He's also known as the Urban Monk. The book is called Exploring Karma, Consciousness, and the Divine. So one of the key things about being a mindful leader is to being able to ask ourselves this question throughout our lives not just once or twice, on a regular basis, constantly asking myself, what is my motivation for doing what I'm doing? So I was a monk for 15 years, living in New York City. Two years ago, I moved out of the monastic order, so I'm no longer a monk. And if it's not in the past, the mind is in the future. It's planning something all the time. Even while you're sitting and listening to me, you might be planning an email, some of you might be thinking about, man, I wonder what the lunch menu is going to be. How many of you are thinking about lunch accidentally? Research is showing that it helps individuals become more productive. So if a bunch of people in your organization are becoming more productive and working more cooperatively, I can't imagine how that's not helping a company uh, grow. If you're in a leadership role and you have to give negative feedback, it's like withdrawing from that emotional bank account. Two ears and a mouth. We take it for granted because that's what we come with, right? We're being told that we should be listening twice as much as we speak. We've heard all of this stuff about uh, mindfulness and it seems so buzzy. Explain what that is, first of all. Basically, mindfulness means to become aware of your thoughts and emotions and come into the present moment because most of the time we're not in the present moment. We're either planning the future or we're stuck in the past. Our mind is like a roommate, a crazy roommate that never shuts up. <laughs> I like to think of the mind as like our smartphone. Okay? And in our smartphone, whenever you have too many apps open, it slows the phone down, right? So you close them out. So our mind has a gazillion apps open. We really want to create a culture of appreciation and where we can actually learn to celebrate and appreciate the success of others. And according to the Harvard Business Review, positive social connections at work produce highly desirable results. But mindfulness can literally change your brain. According to Forbes, it makes you more productive, right? If you can clear, clear out those apps, won't you become more focused and productive? Absolutely. And if people are happier, then they'll be more productive and more positive. And that means the retention levels will be better. Thank you, I'm really happy to be here. And since it was mentioned that I lived as a monk for 15 years, I figured I have to explain why I lived as a monk for 15 years to get that out of the way. It's interesting because two years ago I moved out of the monastic order, so I'm no longer a monk. So while I was a monk, people was always ask me, why did you become a monk? And now that I'm no longer a monk, people are asking me, why are you no longer a monk? So it seems like ans answering those questions is just a part of my karma, sort of. Um, so I ended up going to India and living as a monk for about, the idea was to be there for a month, I spent six months there, traveling around, living in a monastery with 40 other monks, waking up at four in the morning, meditating for two hours a day. I really thought I was going to freak out at this lifestyle, but somehow I fell in love with it. Right? Sleeping on the floor, doing simple services. Then I came back to the U.S., moved into a monastery in New York City of all places, and decided to spend another six months as a monk, just to keep that experience going, because it was the most deeply fulfilling experience I'd ever had in my life. And it turns out that I ended up spending another 14 and a half years living in New York as a monk. The mind. And what is the mind? Because if you think about it, most of our stress and anxiety comes from our mind. It's not so much the external situation, it's how we perceive that situation. So I'm sure we've all had an experience where you've perhaps had an argument with somebody, like a, you know, somebody you don't like and you're arguing with them, and you realize the whole argument was taking place simply in your mind. You were, you were yelling at them, and then you were coming up with dialogue for them that they were yelling back at you in your mind. You guys can relate to this? Or just because I live in New York, am I the only crazy one here? here? <laughs> okay, so I'm hoping you've all had this experience, otherwise I'm sounding completely nuts here. Um, so, you know, the mind is really the cause of our stress and anxiety and depression. And mindfulness meditation can really help with this. So I like to compare the mind to a hard drive, which stores unlimited information. Everything we smell, taste, touch, see, or hear gets registered in the mind. But most of it 
we're not even aware of. According to psychology today, an average person has between 25,000 and 50,000 thoughts a day. That's about one to 2,000 thoughts every single hour. We're having so many thoughts, but we're not even aware of our thoughts. Like every two seconds, your mind goes off to something else. Right? And what is our mind doing? It's doing two things. It's either thinking about the past or it's planning the future. And what unfortunately happens is a lot of times the mind focuses on negative things from the past. Right? How many here are bothered by something that happened to them a year ago? In some ways you were hurt, but somehow you still remember it. Raise your hand if you, right? How many of you are bothered by something that happened five years ago? You happen to just remember it, not on purpose, but it just comes up, right? Ten years ago? <laughs> Twenty years, <laughs> right? So the mind has a hard time letting go. But a lot of those things have no relevance in our lives right now. But it comes up. If you could choose, you would choose not to remember those things. But you see, the mind is on autopilot. So the point about mindfulness is to bring it so that it's not on autopilot and that we can actually have more control over what goes on up here. And if it's not in the past, the mind is in the future. It's planning something all the time. Even while you're sitting and listening to me, you might be planning an email. Some of you might be thinking about, I wonder what the lunch menu is going to be. How many of you are thinking about lunch accidentally? If not purposely, but accidentally, yeah. So, you know, I like to think of the mind as like our smartphone. And in our smartphone, whenever you have too many apps open, it slows the phone down, right? So you close them out. So our mind has a gazillion apps open. The food app is one of those that just can't close. You know, it's one of those things that comes with the phone. You can't even delete it if you wanted to. So that one's just kind of open. You know, you're eating lunch. You're going to be thinking, I wonder what's going to be for dinner. Now, since that, so that's mindfulness. How can that impact us as we engage in a leadership capacity? Right? So... If we can have less emotional reactivity and better relationships, mindfulness will help us have more balanced emotions so that we don't lose our cool, especially in a workplace environment, working in teams. Lose your cool and it can really mess things up. It can really hurt relationships. So it allows us to remain emotionally balanced, more calm, more cool during difficult situations. It also will allow us, if we can remain calm and cool, to communicate with compassion. Communicate thoughtfully. Communicate in, with a sensitivity. Am I going to uninspire this individual by giving them whatever feedback that I need to give them? Is it going to be inspiring for them? Are they going to be uninspired when they go back to their desk? And also, it'll help us remember the very simple formula that we have two ears and a mouth. <clears throat> if we use them in those proportions, all our communication will improve. And by nature's arrangement, our mouth is naturally closed and our ears are naturally open. And now, just take a moment to feel the weight of your body pushing down into the chair. And try to keep your mind present. If it starts planning, just bring it back. Feel your feet pushing down into the floor. Feel yourself leaning back into the chair. Now begin to take a few deep breaths just through your nose if possible. And as you breathe in, feel the cool breath going in and really fill your lungs. Let's take nice and deep breaths. The deep breathing in itself has an incredible ability to release tension from our muscles and our mind. And as you exhale, completely empty out your lungs. Feel the cool breath going in through the nose. And when you exhale, notice that the breath is warmer. Thank you very much for your...